lecture series here as we're looking at Karl Barth and we have with us um, to share in, in this um, evening's presentations, at least for the next three sessions, um, Dr. Sam Durley. Um, Sam is a seminarian from the uh, from Ripon College in Cuddiston, and he's here spending the this semester with us, himself, his wife, and two youngsters, one just recently born. Sam is going to introduce himself to us, and so I'm just going to pass it on to him now to continue um, this presentation. Please, let's welcome him. Good evening. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, in this room this evening and to uh, the few of you who I believe are online, many of you but online by the looks of it. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Clark and Dr. Cannon Sands for um, inviting me to deliver these three seminars to you over the next three weeks. Um, like Dr. Clark just said, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself um, so you know a bit about who I am and my background, because that's actually quite important about the material that I'm going to cover over the next three weeks. So my name is Sam, and I'm a, an ordinand, as we say in England, in the Church of England based at Ripon College Cudston, which is a tiny village just on the edge of the, the city of Oxford. Um, my academic and professional background is actually the natural sciences. Before I put myself forward for ordination, I completed an undergraduate in biomedical sciences, and then I completed a PhD in molecular biology. And then I spent about seven and a half years working as a molecular biologist in the context of cancer research. Um, and I did that at the University of Sussex and then for about nearly five years at the University of Oxford. Um, I also undertook an undergraduate degree in theology at Oxford, and then I did my master's in theology at, uh, it was awarded by the University of Durham. And I'm currently researching for my PhD in systematic theology at the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, and that's why I have a, a lot of letters after my name. It's in no way to do with how clever I am is simply because I've refused to get a job and I've spent my entire adult life at university. Um, however, because of my background and because of my vocation to the service and ministry of the church, when I think about God, I reflexively think about science. And when I think about science, I reflexively think about God. So my PhD research is naturally at that interface between science and theology. And what I'd like to, uh, to do over the next three weeks is just give you an idea of how I've come to grapple with that area of science and theology, particularly through systematic theology. And what I'm particularly interested in is a method in which I think is suitable for articulating Christianity in a way that is relevant for the audience of today, because I think that is the task of the church and it's the task of a priest. The task of the church is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to its contemporary audience. And that's why I've subtitled this uh, series of talks, A New Application. How do we apply the academic theology that we learn in the, in the seminary or in our theological degrees? How do we apply that knowledge in the context of our church as priests, as ministers, as readers, whatever your role is in a church? And so here I'm going to present uh, a very particular theology, that of Karl Barth. But it, there will always be that application in mind. I'm always trying to think about how we're going to do that. That's what my PhD thesis is aiming to be. It's an application of systematic theology. There is no point in my mind proclaiming the gospel if it's not going to register with those who we are speaking to. And we need to speak into their context. So let me try and give you a bit of a silly example to demonstrate what I think systematic theology is. So I'm going to play you a song, which is from my home in England. And if you began to sing it, every single person in the country of England would be able to finish this song for you. I'm getting married in the morning. Ding dong, the bells are gonna chime. Pull out the stopper, let's have a whopper, but get me to the church on time. So that piece of music is taken from a musical called My Fair Lady. And I really wouldn't be able to make this analogy if it wasn't for, for hearing what I'm just about to play you when I was on the bus to Bridgetown uh, only a couple of days ago with a number of people in this room. And I heard this. I do. I'm getting married in the morning. Ding dong, you hear the church bell ring. She asked. 
church on time. What do you mean, man? So I kind of hope that silly illustration kind of illustrates a point. They were the same words, two different songs, one that speaks to one culture and one that speaks to a totally different one. One that will resonate in one culture, but not in another. But they're the same words. So for me, that's the way I see the task of theology, to make the gospel make sense to those who are going to hear it. Systematic theology gives that framework, the rules for our theology, our understanding of God, and the words we use to describe it. Just as there are different rules and rhythms for reggae music and different rules for musical theatre, I think there are different ways of speaking theology in different cultures and different times. And, and this is, has precedent in history. Just some examples from recent history, you've got black theology, liberation theology, feminist theology. All these are different ways of proclaiming the same gospel, but in a different way, a different system. So they resonate with different audience who can hear them and it is meaningful. And so the context which I find myself in England, especially around a university city, is a scientifically literate audience who are well aware what science and scientists have to say about the world and what they generally say is there is no God. Now, if you're going to believe in science, that it is only natural and logical that you will be an atheist. My context that I need to proclaim the gospel in is a secular, scientifically minded and skeptical society, one where science becomes for God, especially in our knowledge and our understanding of our existence and reality. So how am I going to preach the gospel to these people? And how do I do that in a way that stays true and faithful to what we believe? It's still faithful to the gospel narrative and the creeds and traditions of the church, because I don't think we can just abandon what we believe to make ourselves more relevant. And a great contemporary example of a theologian who does this is Rowan Williams. He's an Anglican, so we all must agree that he's brilliant. Um, but much of what he writes is about contemporary culture, uh, political opinions, multiculturalism, secularism, immigration, all these things that are culturally relevant to a contemporary audience, but then he responds theologically to those concerns. And that's why the reason of systematic theology never ends. Systematic theologians, I hope, are never going to become redundant because culture and society are always changing. So theology also always needs to change too. The gospel doesn't need to change, but the way we say it does. And the task of a systematic theologian, I think, is to identify what's wrong with the current system and try and propose a new one. And what I'm going to talk about Bart today is a, a, an amazing example of that. And I tried to have the same motivation for when I'm doing my research. How do I proclaim the gospel in society to take science seriously, uh, where the same science says, no, says there's no God? And that's a question that's always in the back of my mind when I'm uh, doing my theology. So what I'm going to do over the next three weeks is present my proposal, my thesis as to how to make it possible to still make God relevant in the society that I want to proclaim the gospel in. And I think it's really important to highlight the beginning of this uh, three seminar series that my context might not be as relevant to you. But I think personally, it probably is or certainly will be because scientific literacy is only ever increasing. Atheist voices are only ever getting louder, and the church keeps finding itself on the edge of relevance to the society it aims to serve. And it's also worth saying that the theological tools I'm using are the ones of my context, that the ones surround me in my educational and intellectual environment. I've been exclusively educated in Western Europe, who have also inherited that intellectual uh, history, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and two world wars. So my thinking, the way I think about theology, is also shaped by the culture I've grown up in and the intellectual traditions of that culture, which will almost certainly be different to yours. So one of the main motivating factors for me coming here to Barbados to spend three months here was to open myself up to other cultural and intellectual horizons to be challenged and informed by you, to come and learn some new music to which I can sing the gospel to, because that might be what is needed in England. I think it's one of the great pities of the global church, the different denominations, provinces, dioceses, and let's face it, even parishes sometimes, who have intellectual tools that may benefit each other. But when we're confronted with problems, I think we tend to look internally rather than to the people outside of that environment. Because part of the problem for me might be that actually the tools I need are already available. It's just this intellectual arrogance and protectionism that means that those insights or thoughts just don't get heard. So I really encourage you to challenge and question everything I have to say over the next few weeks. Anyway, so that's my, my preamble out of the way. 
And now I'm going to spend the next 30, 35 minutes or so giving you an introduction to Karl Barth, who's probably the most important and influential theologian in Europe, or at least I think so. I think he's the most important and influential theologian ever, but that's my personal preference. Um, but, and, but his proposal really has to find the theological task in the last hundred years or so, especially in Europe. Um, and his motivation to do theology is what I've described. He identified a problem. He saw a big problem in theology and a big problem in society. So he proposed a new system of how to do theology. The next week, uh, I will speak about the consequences of what Karl Barth's theology does um, and how we talk about God in this new system. And particularly, I'll talk about the death of God, which is a, a big consequence of Barth's understanding of Jesus Christ. And then in the third and final seminar, I will talk about the problem I think there is in my culture uh, when it comes to proclaiming the gospel, especially that relationship between uh, theology and science, um, but how I think systematic theology, uh, especially of Karl Barth, his music of theology can be used so that the gospel is still relevant. And finally, I know I'm speaking to an audience with varying knowledge and experience with theology and so this systematic theology particularly. I know some people have just started their formal studies, some people have been studying for a few years, and some people, I'm not going to look at uh, Dr. Cannon Sands, some people have probably been studying for longer than I've been alive. Um, so I apologize if I emphasize anything that's obvious uh, and already you know. So the way I want to introduce Karl Barth is by starting with the problem that he saw when it came to proclaiming the gospel. I want you to try and imagine this. Nine million soldiers are dead. Ten million civilians are dead. Twenty-one million people are seriously injured. The great superpowers of Europe, the home of the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution and modern democracy have just spent the last four years doing their best to kill each other. And this war was legitimized and defined by the people that have just taught you theology. And this is the situation that Karl Barth found himself in, in 1918 at the end of World War I. And it gets worse because in 1933, Adolf Hitler came into power in Germany and he co-opted part of the Protestant church in Germany into legitimizing national socialism, which is the ideology of the Nazi party. Um, so the relationship between the church and state in Germany in the early, 19th, uh, in the early 20th century, sorry, is fascinating. Uh, but it's not something I, I, I have got time to go into too much detail this evening. But that point I want you to understand is Karl Barth witnessed firsthand the devastating consequences of mass war. He witnessed his theological intellectual heroes legitimizing and promoting the actions of the state that led to the war through their understanding of the Christian faith. And as you might be guessing, Karl Barth was part of a counter movement against this. In the organization of the church, this was the confessing church in Germany. Uh, though many people in this church, including Karl Barth himself, had to flee or were deported from Germany for, uh, for being part of the confessing church because they opposed the Nazi regime. However, again, I won't go into, into much into Bart's role in the Confessing Church, but if you want to read something incredible, the Barman Declaration, B-A-R-M-E-N, Barman Declaration, was a hugely important document that the Confessing Church uh, produced, and it defined the Christian opposition to any interpretation of Christianity based on racial theories. And that's a scary phrase in itself, but you can probably understand why that comes into, into Nazi Germany. But today the focus on, on Karl Barth is going to be on his theology, but what I, I hope is always his theology and his context and mission are always tightly linked. So just to fill you on some quick biographical details, there is Karl Barth on the front page of the Time magazine. Imagine a theologian today being on the front page of a very popular magazine, but that's how famous a theologian he was. As the date suggests, he lived across two world wars. Uh, he was Swiss. He had to flee from the Nazis, like I said, and he's probably the most important theologian of the 21st, 20th century. Um, he was a Calvinist, so a reformed theologian, and this will be hugely significant on his theology, which we'll talk about in a second. And so that is the cultural environment that Barth is sinking in. War, Nazis, mass death and suffering. And there was a direct link to the theology of his day. So then let's just take a look at the theology of his day. And that theology was called liberal theology which is often called liberal Protestantism, the, the same thing. And this was the type of theology that Karl Barth was taught when he studied theology at university. And Alistair McGrath, uh, a famous uh, 
theologian and uh, theological historian, he says that liberal Protestantism is unquestionably one of the most important movements to have arisen with modern, within modern Christian thought. And he's not necessarily saying that in a good way. He's not necessarily that's a positive thing, but it was very important. And as I'm trying to fit a big story of liberal Protestantism or liberal, liberal theology, as I'll call it, I will inevitably slightly caricature and exaggerate a little when I describe what liberal theology is, but that will hopefully just make the argument a bit easier to follow. Uh, and I find that a much easier way to kind of present it. So liberal theology is based around a few key theologians. And the one you may have heard of is uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher. And he wrote at the end of the 18th and early 19th century. So about a century before Karl Barth. And his basic premise, to paraphrase in a, in a slightly uh, facetious way, he says, every human feels a bit religious. Everyone feels like there's something more to life. There's meaning and purpose, which cannot be explained by reason alone. But the problem was having a Christian faith based on the scriptures on the Bible, the revelation of the church, was counter to what we knew through modern knowledge. By the end of the 18th century, we had both Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin, and both of those had given huge explanatory power to the natural sciences. And a lot of those appear to be counter traditional, to traditional Christian teachings. So how do you reconcile this gap in the knowledge? So much of the program of liberal theology was to bridge that gap between Christian theology and modern knowledge. And really, when I'm saying modern knowledge, what I really mean is science. So if we take a look at the Wesleyan uh, quadrilateral, which is the one on the left, and then you've got Hooker's three-legged stool on the right, so these are the sources of theology, we can see the, the different ways that theology is done. Now, liberal theology has said that scripture or revelation is not a reliable so source of knowledge for God. It's full of claims and statements that are clearly erroneous or false if we compare them to what we know through science. So we have to use experience and reason in, in uh, Hooker's uh, three-legged store, there's only reason, experience wasn't there, um, but it's, it's thinking. So this theology is done by reasoning. And this is why it's often called natural theology or philosophical theology. And it's directly linked to Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, all of these thinkers who use reason and experience alone to know about God. And I'd like to emphasize the same thing I made earlier. This is the same problem and solution model for systematic theology. The problem is knowledge by reason does not match knowledge by revelation. How can we trust revelation anymore? And what was the solution for, for liberal theology? Well, their solution was to reconstruct religious belief to fit around the new knowledge obtained by science. So one of the key beliefs I'm going to come back to a lot over the next, well, this seminar and the next two, because for me, it's, it's where theology went terribly, terribly wrong, and I hope you'd agree, and I don't think it's still recovered yet, is that liberal theology knows from science that people do not come back from the dead. They also know that people don't do miracles because they go counter to the laws of nature. So what did liberal theology do about Jesus Christ? Someone who Revelation and Scripture uh, suggest performed miracles and came back from the dead. So to sum it up vaguely is that, or, or, or concisely, sorry, what liberal theology said was instead that Jesus Christ wasn't divine. He was stripped of his divinity and he was just made a man. He was made a perfect man, a man that humanity could hope to follow, but in the times of the, of the gospel writing and the traditions of the church, he'd been dressed up a bit, a bit zhushed up and made a bit, a bit godly to make him appear a bit divine because that's what the theology of the early church needed. But actually, Jesus was just a man. That's what liberal theology is taught. You might have heard of the quest of the historical Jesus. That was a quest to find that real man that was behind this kind of divine caricature, this divine character that the church had created. And the reason for this was if you could find the real man, then you could discover the perfect human, the perfect way to live life. Now, you might react strongly against this liberal theology, but liberal theology was and actually still is a very popular way of doing theology. And I can have some sympathy with this. Why should we be trying to defend miracles and the resurrection of Jesus when, again, in modern times, uh, we, we talk of science here, modern science says resurrection and miracles are impossible. 
How does that make the gospel sound to your modern audience when you stand up and tell them about a man who came back from the dead? I don't think we need to abandon those core beliefs. And I think the liberal theology project fails for many reasons. And I'll come back to this again, especially in the third seminar. So liberal theology doesn't look great for Christian doctrine, but liberal theology also failed massively in a social and cultural way. As I said, because this theology ended up being used to, to support the war effort of Germany. And the danger of liberal theology, uh, which meant it came to be used by politicians and national leaders to justify war, quoting again from Alistair McGrath, he said this, liberalism was inspired by the vision of a humanity which was ascending into new realms of progress and prosperity. He's trying to say that there's a new type of human being who have reached new levels of progress. The doctrine of evolution gave new vitality to this belief. Human beings were evolving to become more uh, progressive and more prosperous. And this was nurtured and, and it was a, a feeling that came about because it, in, in, it was nurtured by strong evidence of cultural stability and progress in Western Europe in the late 19th century. Europe was the place to be. It was producing the writers, the thinkers, the musicians, culture, everything was coming from Europe. Religion came increasingly to be seen as relating to the spiritual needs of modern humanity and giving ethical guidance to society. If you know the true religion, the true morals, the best way to live life, you are a better people, a better nation, a better race. That sounds scary. Christianity had become all about the human religious experience. Liberal theology wanted to find the true morals and goodness in society, but the outworkings of this was one particular society, Germany in this case, believing that it had discovered the best human values based on the morality and teachings of God. But this transformed into a country that thought it was its moral and religious duty to impose that progress on other people. And this led to war, mass death and huge human suffering. And it's a bit of an understatement to say, this seems to destroy the credibility of the liberal theology project. But liberal theology was this theology that Karl Barth had learned when he studied it at university, particularly from a man called Adolf von Harnack. He was Barth's intellectual hero, but von Harnack was one of the many theologians who signed a manifesto called the Manifesto of the 93. This was a letter by a number of distinguished intellectuals, some Nobel Prize winners, some theologians, some priests, and they were all arguing that the leadership of Germany was right to go to war. Before I go any further, is there any questions that people would like to ask about that first bit? Doesn't matter if there's not. No, no problem. So this example of Karl Barth as a systematic theologian is a fairly extreme one. The cultural context was extreme, huge political and social changes, mass war, suffering and death on a continental scale with huge human atrocities being committed. The question that was being asked was where is God? And one example of another theologian who you've probably heard of who was contemporary and um, massively influenced by the theology of Barth was a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, someone who was also a prisoner of the Nazis and ended up being executed for his opposition. So this was a very live debate and Karl Barth was at the center of it. So Karl Barth saw, saw liberal theology as a concerted human attempt to subvert revelation, to demote the role of scripture and particularly the life of Jesus Christ in how we know about God. And instead make the claim that what we need to know about God can be determined only by, um, by reason without any recourse to revelation of the scriptures whatsoever. So Barth's project was to get theology focused back on the Bible again, back on the scriptures, back on doing theology by theology's own terms, by studying its own unique source and unique source, and that unique source is God's revelation. Barth's theology, because of this, is often called neo-orthodoxy, because it's often compared by many to the theological projects of Calvin and Luther, who wanted the same thing. They wanted theology to focus on the scriptures and on the Bible, rather than focusing on reason and experience and tradition, because they felt that this is where the Roman Catholic Church had gone wrong. Calvin and Luther thought the role of scripture in Roman Catholic theology was being abused. And this was diagnosed as causing the Roman Catholic Church to promote views that were not true to the church. 
So as Bart himself was a Calvinist, maybe it's not surprising that this is how Bart's theological response was formulated. However, what makes Bart stand out more in comparison to Calvin and Luther is Bart took an enormous theological project to produce a really positive reconstruction of theology. Rather than just a negative description of the state of theology, which would have obviously been very easy to do, instead he committed his life to producing his very famous Church Dogmatics, which covers an impressive six million words over 12 very, very thick books. It's an absolute masterpiece of a work. It's so long that he died before he finished it. But it has been very, very influential on theology since because it proposes a theologically justified method of theology where the primary source of doing theology is scripture. So let's try and say that in other words. Bart spends a lot of time theologically justifying why the source of theology should be the scriptures. And that probably sounds like a whole load of tautologies and unnecessary descriptions, but I'm going to try and explain that now, because that's Bart's key doctrine of the word of God, which is the doctrine I really want to talk about, a doctrine on revelation itself. So a doctrine on why scripture is the most important bit. This doctrine takes up two very thick books, um, hundreds and hundreds of pages, but this is what Bart bases his entire theology on. And really the doctrine can be simply stated as this. The word of God is Jesus Christ, witnessed in the scriptures and spoken by revelation, uh, spoken by the church. The word of God is Jesus Christ, witnessed in the scriptures and spoken by the church. So there's a threefold um, explanation there of what revelation is. And if you're thinking threefold, that sounds a bit Trinitarian. Is there a link to the Trinity? Correct. But that's about another 10 hours of explanation. So we're not going to go into why that's related to the Trinity, but it, it very much is. It's related to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we have a threefold understanding of what revelation is. Firstly, when we preach the gospel, all that should be done here is to re-witness the life and death of Jesus Christ. According to Bart, preaching is not supposed to be about human beings, but about God, who revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the scriptures are a record by the people who witnessed Jesus Christ firsthand. So therefore, the scriptures are the first example of the church witnessing the life and death of Jesus Christ to a new audience. And thirdly, and the most important bit, Revelation is God's word made flesh in Jesus Christ. The word is God. God is word. Or to put it in Bart's own words, God is his own self-revelation. God is his own self-revelation. And I really want to emphasize that is. Because whilst this means that God reveals himself in Jesus Christ, he reveals himself totally as the being of God. What God reveals himself as is what he is, not what he was, not what he will be, but what he is. So let me try and pull it another way. And this is the way that I always think about what Bart's trying to get at here and the relationship between the being of God and revelation. And this is what's so key to Bart's theology. Uh, a tough, hard question at 20 to 9 on a Tuesday evening to a bunch of seminarians but can someone tell me what God does in Exodus 3.14? Without looking at their phones? <laughs> it's fine. In, in Exodus 3.14, God tells us what his name is. Moses says to God, so this is, this is actually Exodus 3.13 to 3.14. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are, say, you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So what God is saying in this, or the revelation here of the God is what's saying, is that God is not a static object who does actions to other subjects. To write a sentence, I play football. I am the subject. I do something to an object. I kick the ball. But 
In Revelation, God does himself. I is the subject of Revelation, which is God. The pre predicate of Revelation, am, is there, is the verb, which is also God. And the object of Revelation is I am. God is God in his own self-revelation. God does God. That's the key part of Bart's understanding. So when we receive revelation, God self-defines himself as this God. God becomes God as he reveals himself. I am who I am. So when Eberhard Jungel, who produced one of the seminal studies of the theology of Karl Barth, he called his book, God's Being is in Becoming. God becomes God. But importantly, God becomes God with humanity in Revelation. God becomes God with us. So the way I think of God is not as a subject, not as a person, not as an object, but as a verb. God is an action. It's not a thing. It's an action. God is an action. And what we see as humans, we see that action as revelation. God doing God. And the point that is crucial to understand with Karl Barth's theology is that relationship between God and revelation. It's a mutual revelation, a relationship, sorry, a mutual relationship of being. God is what he is in revelation. There is not a God behind revelation, which we see. There's not a God pretending to be that God. There's not a predetermined God who's being exist before that revelation. What Bart is saying is as God is revealed, he becomes that God. God is with us. He is an I am. In God's revelation, therefore, we see all of God's being. So that makes revelation very much more exciting because it means it's a living and moving thing. It was given, us, given to us by God, not just at one time, but something that is now the life of the church. As God is revealed, God becomes God to those people who hear the gospel of Christ. So the church is called to be the witness to God with that gift of revelation to continue proclaiming God, because as God is proclaimed, he still becomes God. Revelation is alive. Now a complicated bit, if that wasn't complicated enough. What I really want to make clear is that Bart is not trying to make the Bible divine. The words in themselves are not divine. But what I also want to make really clear is that Bart is saying that scriptures are divine. And this is classic Bart. It's a right pain. He loves doing these things where he gives opposites all the time, which is why he's often called a dialectic theologian. He creates opposites, contrasts. And here what he's trying to do is highlight the difference between humans and God. So the human side of the Bible, the human side of scripture, this record of revelation. The work of scripture is human work. It's fallible and open to interpretation. It is not divine. It is written by humans to pass on the witness to the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not perfect. And it was written for the cultural and historical context of that audience. However, the divine revelation that is being witnessed is Jesus Christ, is divine, God incarnate. So therefore the scriptures are also divine. The scriptures are a witness to this revelation, and the church's role is to proclaim this. So when the church proclaims a word, it is proclaiming God revealed as Jesus Christ. So this revelation is also divine. So why is Bart's theology in such contrast to liberal theology? Well, because Bart takes Jesus as God very, very seriously. What happens to Jesus in his life, ministry, and death is not ad extra. It's not superfluous to what God is. What happens to Jesus Christ is constitutive to the being of God. The revelation of God in Jesus is God's being. And what's the key event that happens in the life of God as revealed to us? It is that God dies. He is nailed to a cross and he dies. So if we were to take Karl Barth seriously, the crucifixion is an event within the being of God. So does God die? Come back next week and I will tell you the answer. Uh, 
but the important point against liberal theology at, is that Bart prevents us from stripping back the life and events of Jesus Christ to find the true God behind all the stuff that happens in Revelation. He prevents us from going back to finding this abstract God that we can then apply to the human condition to understand how we live in a perfect way, just as Jesus did. That's what liberal theology wanted to do. Define God as a way of understanding the best way for humans to live. Theology was all about human beings. What Bart wants to do is theology to be about God. So for Bart, theology is a discipline which it seeks to keep the proclamation of the witness to Jesus Christ true to its foundations as revealed in the scriptures, as revealed in the witness of, of, of the gospels. And what I've tried to make obvious here that Bart's reason for making scripture the primary source of revelation is not made by sources outside of theology. The rationale for using scripture is based on the rationale of God himself. So much so that Bart's theology is often described as theological theology, which might sound a bit odd. Surely all theology is theological. But as, as you saw with liberal theology, philosophy and reason become dominant in the theological task. And then it's more philosophical or natural theology. But Bart's theology is its own unique discipline. He calls it a science but it's a unique science that cannot be measured by any other science other than itself. The boundaries of theology must be set by the, the theological task and source. So finally, as we run it late into the evening and you're either desperate to go to bed or get a beer, or maybe you're desperate to run into the library to pick up the 12 volumes of Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics and make a start on those 6 million words tonight and have it done by the morning. Good luck. Um, let me try and explain the consequences of Barthian theology. And the most important point to take home is that with Barthian theology, there is no other God for us to discover beyond the one that's in the scriptures. The God of revelation is the God of Christianity. When we proclaim the word of God, we are witnessing Jesus again. That's the role of the church to continue to be the continuing to continue to be the witness to Jesus Christ. God is constantly then being revealed and becoming God. God still lives with us today. There is a God for us in all times and all places where God can be proclaimed. But Bart doesn't come without criticism. Bart's theology is often criticized of being called fideistic, which means that it's got an internal testing system. Theology has theology as its own marking sheet. If my theology is that the scriptures say that Jesus performed miracles and someone says, what is your evidence for that? My only response is because it says so in the scriptures. So it becomes a little bit difficult to understand how culture and society can influence theology to be more suitable for the culture of the day. So one of Bart's key critics was yet another German, all modern theologians were German for some reason. Uh, this one actually managed to live in the United States for most of his life. He was called Paul Tillich. Uh, he was a, a, a neoliberal theologian, uh, and he was uh, Bart's most famous critic, and he wrote in the 50s and the 60s. Whereas Bart said that theology should set its own questions and then work out its answers, what Tillich wanted was to move back towards that more liberal idea. We need, we need to study culture and philosophy because that's where you get the ultimate questions from. And to some extent, I agree. And I, I, I will agree actually with that quite a lot in, in the third talk. But what he says is to answer those questions, there needs to be a conversation between gospel and culture that has to be corrective. Culture is allowed to correct what we believe. Then we have to ask what dogmas are essential, which ones are we gonna correct and which ones are we not? Should we abandon the seven day creation doctrine because science says that is impossible? Maybe. Do we abandon the idea of miracles because they go against the laws of nature? Probably not. I really do like Tillich's theology, but you have to ask if he has to abandon Christianity or at least some of the central dogmas of Christianity to get there, maybe it's not a good system that we should embrace. And I hope what you can say I'm getting at is that there's this deep relationship between science and theology that's run through quite a lot of what I've said today. It is fundamental if your culture is one where the music of the day is science. The music isn't reggae or musical theatre anymore. It's often cold, calculating science. And I hope that resonates with what I said at the very beginning about my context as a priest. That's going to be my context, a culture of scientifically minded people.
So taking Bart's theology forward, it's taking Revelation very seriously as the events and actions of God. Why would you want to come back again next week and give up an hour or so uh, listening to me? Well, the question I really want to get excited about is one I've already mentioned. What happens on Good Friday? What happens to the being of God? In the Nicene Creed, what do we say we believe happened to Jesus? We say, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He suffered death. And the revelation of God is God, according to Bart. The revelation of God is that he died. So a question for you. Do you believe that God, the being of God, died on Good Friday? What and where is God on Holy Saturday then? Is he now just a twosome between the Father and Spirit, or is God no longer existing? Or do we say, which is what I think happens, do we say, ah, yeah, when we say Jesus is God, we don't really mean that he's so much God that he'll die. There's a bit of God that's safe. But then if we do that, we have to begin on picking Bart's doctrine and revelation and say Jesus' life isn't completely God's revelation. So next week will be an example of someone who takes that dogma of Jesus' life being completely God's revelation to its extreme. Um, and, and we will talk about what that means for the being of God, what it means for us as humans, and ultimately how this boils down to a question still about God, because it's about the Trinity and not about humanity. Um, and that is me just about finished before nine o'clock. And if there are any questions um, or comments or thoughts, I would love to hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dirty. We open the floor now for any questions. Um, since this is a webinar, all you need to do is raise your hand and we will give you permission to speak. Okay. Any questions? Seems you had a very thorough presentation. Oh, <clears throat> Dr. Sands. Okay. Given Bob's context, reference to the First World War and all that pain and suffering and death and dying and rest. Bob does experience play in his theology. I know he's a little approaching primary source of theology. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my position as well. But where does experience? Does he make a lot, given what he had seen and experienced? Mm -hmm. Just let me elaborate just a little further. Uh, as apartheid was on his deathbed, some years before that, of course, Bart was found helped by some of the black developments in the Republic of South Africa. Mm -hmm. Publication on reading Bart in South Africa. <laughs> Uh, and experience there was no less real than in Germany, especially Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I repeat my question, where does experience feature in this theology? What part does experience play? How important is experience? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, it's picked up a huge amount in future Bartian theologians or people who base their theology in Karl Barth. And that this theology, because it places God in Jesus Christ, it also places God in a human who suffers 
who is persecuted, who is chaste, who is ultimately killed. So this gives God a very with us face. But the problem with much of uh, philosophical theology is it, it made that huge division. God was up there, something to be thought about, and had very little understanding of what it was like to be a person. Whereas Karl Barth's theology, if you, if you really emphasize this Jesus Christ as being God and then read what happens in the gospel, you see a man who suffers. Uh, so one of the most kind of uh, famous books that came, came out after Barth or, or, or a similar time anyway, was by Jürgen Moltmann, who's called The Crucified God, which places all that theology there on the cross, on the suffering God. So suffering God became a, a, a huge kind of idea in the, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it was all of that, that experience. How does God know what it feels like? Where's that empathy? Where's that love in God? And if you put God in a man, a man who walked around with us, and a man who we killed, then you, you've got that experience there. You can, you can get that relation. There's that ability to relate between the human and the divine experience. Thank you, Sam. Um, any other questions from the group? Yes. Um, go ahead, Eleanor. Good evening to all and to the presenter. <clears throat> We're listening. I'm just going back to the statement, God becomes God as he reveals himself. And using my limited exposure to modern science, it's almost as though we're picturing God or presenting God as a hologram. <laughs> when we talk about the death of God on Good Friday, are we talking substance here? Are we talking physiology? Um, could you give some clarity here? Because <laughs> it seems as though there is a shift in imagery or experience of God. Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I missed the beginning of your question. I was um, making reference to your statement, God becomes God as he reveals himself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a great Almost question. Almost like a, a hologram what, kind of thing. Um, the, the theologian who I'll talk about next week, who, who comes in the path of Robert uh, Karl Barth, is a guy called Robert Jensen. And he says, this is what we find most offensive about Christianity, is that mm -hmm. the gospel seems to proclaim a God who dies, um, which goes counter to everything we know about gods. Gods don't die, yeah. gods don't change, gods don't suffer. Um, right. For me, as we've just spoken about, this makes God much more relatable, much more with us, much more involved in the human experience. And it also makes the Easter narrative a dramatic event within the being of God. If you kill God, which mm -hmm. is kind of what it looks like happens and what, what the tradition of the church is, uh, what always was um, until possibly liberal theology came along, was this is what the church believed, that God died. But suddenly we became a bit nervous about that. You can't kill the divine, can you? And for me, if you make this an event within the, within the life of God, God has to make a decision to carry on being that God. And Galbart has another incredible doctrine called the doctrine of election, that on Holy Saturday, and this is kind of going a bit of a hint towards next week, but Holy Saturday, God has to make a decision. Does he continue to be that God that he has been with us before? And then you get to bring in concepts such as grace and forgiveness and salvation. Because despite the ultimate rejection in us killing God, he continues to be that God with us and for us by resurrecting on the Holy Sunday, uh, on Easter Sunday, sorry. So I think actually... Well, Karl Barth's called neo-orthodoxy. So I would just say that that's a very orthodox way of seeing it. It's a very um, Nicene, Constantinople way of seeing the, the Easter event. I hope that makes some sense. The kinds of um, 
leads into this scandal of the gospel because one can easily come away with the impression that God is, is, is this impish being that pops in and pops out and, and, and decides to, to change here and change there. And um, for the Christian believer, we will want a bit more stability. <laughs> if you see the... the Absolutely, the yeah. I, I, um, we like tidy. Father Michael and I had a long discussion about this the other day. Theology would be much easier if God was a much tidier thing to understand, if you could write the God formula, if you had an unchanging, eternal being who lived somewhere safe. But the way I read the, 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 the narrative of Revelation is God gets, to, to, to coin a phrase, down and dirty with us. He lives with us. He lives the human experience. This is God being God with people. And our experience is not stable. It's not unchanging and it's not eternal so for god to have the same experience to me makes god much much more relatable so to the human experience and actually i think that's what revelation says is that god is god with us i can't emphasize that with us enough the with us says he knows what it's like to be us and 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 our experience is that unchanging thing and i think that speaks a lot of hope uh, into what uh, canon san said how does that experience come in? And actually, we can see there if we if we read Revelation in that in that kind of way, actually we have a God that understands what it's like to be human in a very very real way, especially in the life of Jesus Christ. And the important thing here, my last comment really, the important thing here is this is human trying to understand God and not the other way around. Sorry, could you just say that again? I said, and the. What is at play here is the human being trying to understand God as opposed to God understanding or making himself known to human being. So we, we can only draw on our limited human knowledge and experience. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a fair criticism of Bart, really, is that um, God ends up being defined by his relationship with humanity. Um, so to what extent has God become dependent on creation and dependent on, on people? Could God be different if there wasn't people to reveal himself to? Um, and the, the short answer is no. If, he, if there weren't people, he wouldn't be the same God. Um, so is it humans trying to understand God? Or is it God trying to understand us? It's a fine line. Um, and, and Bart would say, well, this is the God we have in Revelation. It's the, this is the God that reveals himself to us. He makes himself known to us in a way we'd understand. Um, so I, I think he would be able to defend that this isn't humans trying to understand God. This is try, God trying to make himself understandable to, to human beings. Thank you. We have an, another question. Go ahead, please. Number 463 person. Go ahead and ask your question. You've muted yourself again. I see your hand. 463839. That's the name you have here. You're permitted to speak. Go ahead. I think I had to. I think you have some problems with your mic. Um, you're not receiving you. Any other questions for Dr. Dirty? Uh, four six three eight three nine. If you still want to ask your question, you can probably type it in the chat, and I'll read it for Dr. Durley. Four six three eight 
while he's typing any other questions from any of the other persons, we're happy to see so many of you with us. Dr. Dirty, um, one Kina Nicholas has asked in Kate that it was a lovely presentation. Oh, sorry, it's that again. I said that a, a person by the name of Kina Nicholas has asked to say that it was a lovely presentation. Oh, thank you. Doesn't look as though there are any other questions coming to you. We'd like to probably take this opportunity to express our thanks to you um, for this first presentation. And we will look forward to the follow-up presentations next week, same time, um, using the same link for those of you. Okay, there's, there's Dr. Davis. Um, proceed, Dr. Davis. Uh, good, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm sorry that I've come in at the end because I was involved in another session with uh, a church in, in Maryland and I really wanted to hear from the, the good doctor. Um, I trust that the, um, the presentation will be uh, available on uh, YouTube or whatever one of the links so that I can listen to it again. And I will certainly look forward to the the other two presentations um, that are due on the 8th and, and otherwise. So doctor, thank you for um, being with us. Um, I am a, a faithful alum of Codgerton College and I look forward to hearing you uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Yes, the presentation will be made available and we will put a link on our, our YouTube page so that you can have a look at it. Thank you. Well, if we can just bow our heads as we give God thanks for this time together. Gracious and ever loving God, we give you thanks that you continue to reveal yourself in numerous ways to us as a people, as we evolve, as we grow, as we become. We pray, O oh gracious God, that we may always be mindful of allowing our experience to keep pace with our learning in order that we may come to know you not only through our readings, but also through our experience of you in our daily lives. Be with us as we continue this journey and may your Holy Spirit guide and keep us from day to day. We thank you, gracious God, for this evening, for this time together. And we pray, Lord, that you may be with us as we continue to journey on. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Good evening and thank you for joining us. And we will be placing the presentation on our YouTube page. Every blessing to us. Awesome.